Um, hello there. How are you? A bit tired? <laughs> I have not asked you to stand up today. Don't worry. Um, I think I want to start with, I want to ask you why are you here? What makes this so interesting for you? And like any answer is possible. You can like, I was just sitting here drinking my coffee. Why are you disturbing me? Or um, like, I have uh, 3,000 issues per month incoming to my issue tracker. I need a solution. Um, wh why are you here? Yeah, because backlog, our backlog is en empty, uh, and endless for right. uh, that uh, we could not give error. Okay. So I'm curious why, why, what could be help some communication, maybe provide some solution. Nice. Anyone else? I have a very cool t-shirt. That's why you're here. That's, that's the best reason. That's the best reason to go into a talk I've ever heard. <laughs> cool. Um, I guess we'll talk about that backlog problem then. Um, well, we have the overwhelmed developer, which is the topic. And just to give an introduction, um, we, usually, we oftentimes do this for non-technical people. And I don't know if anyone from sales is here uh, without the technical knowledge. Um, this is essentially how problems start. Things break, and then users um, punch their computers. And then we, the developers, get lots of reports of problems or feature wishes. And that is the problem that we are talking about. Way too much information, and we cannot handle it all. And that is this huge backlog thing that you just talked about. Um, so why am I standing here anyway, and why am I talking about it? Um, we founded a startup, and uh, we did a lot of research. And uh, I learned that putting big numbers on slides is cool. So I put big numbers on slides. And we talked to 150 people, and we found out that a lot of people have this problem, actually. Uh, and we also scraped lots and lots of issues from GitHub. I think by now it's probably double it. but. It doesn't matter anyway. It's a big number, four million, right? Um, so we investigated what are companies like GitLab doing um, for issue triaging. They have very good open community guidelines, um, which I can, by the way, recommend uh, to anyone who's looking at how do I do certain stuff at scale or how do I do certain stuff remotely, GitLab community handbook. Um, so. Let's just get started. I promised some steps that we basically refined. And um, the most important part is you actually have to do something. The backlog doesn't go away on itself. I know we all wish it would, but it doesn't. Um, and we have to regularly and constantly per perform work to keep it clean. Um, so it's not somebody else's problem. It's your problem if you're sitting here, or you have to make it somebody else's problem. Um, but somehow you have to succeed doing that. So let's get started with the actual steps. And um, most of the steps are mm, around you want to close issues, and you want to close them as early as possible. So at first, you want to filter out noise. And in a lot of communities or projects, um, they establish policies and they say that um, we don't want, for example, questions in our issue tracker. We only want bugs and maybe for feature requests, we can write them down into a different system and keep them separate. Uh, so if you receive a question and you say, okay, I don't want questions in this issue tracker, please discuss questions on Slack. And once the questions get boiled down to something concrete that you can actually work with, then you may allow them into your issue tracker. So it starts with filtering out noise and closing issues basically whenever you can. So you have a question, go to Slack. This issue is about an upstream library. We're not going to track it here. We are going to track it over there. If it needs an immediate workaround, then you can file a different issue for that one. So an issue is non-fuzzy, concrete, and actionable. Um, the next important step is checking for duplicates. Um, what we see in, for example, Visual Studio Code, um, 
which is one of the biggest open source repositories, um, I think something like 40% of all issues that they get already exist in their issue tracker. I think, can, can you confirm that as well? You mentioned that you have a huge backlog. Do you have lots of duplicates? Uh, we are trying to avoid them. Okay. Okay. Cool. Does it sometimes happen that people do double work? Okay. Um, so what we've heard from some people, it's not, not everywhere and not like 40% of all issues, certainly not. But sometimes people spend time, spend like a week of time solving an issue. And at the other end of the company, there's somebody else spending a week of time solving the very same issue. And because of that reason, it's super important that you're aware if you have duplicates, that you have duplicates, um, especially if you ha have a bigger team than just five people. Um, what did I do? I apparently switched slides a lot. Um, so the next step is very, very similar. You don't only want to check for duplicates, but you also want to check for similar issues because similar issues can lead to conflicts. And um, I started an open source project once and we had lots of contributors. I think we had more than 500, way more than 500 people contributing. And uh, we constantly had people doing the same thing, but we also constantly had people doing related things. Um, and when one of those things get mer got merged, the other thing wouldn't be possible to get merged because not only of merge conflicts, but also logical conflicts within the concepts. So it makes a lot of sense to mention not only the duplicates, but anything that is related to that sort of topic, especially if it implies an architectural implication. Um, so you want to make sure that the same people know about like everything that's going on in their particular area. And that can um, prevent a lot of wasted work as well. We have had a lot of wasted work at Koala. Um, retrieve missing information is sort of a trivial step, but we do see that um, sometimes people just forget it and they just try to get on about it. And then it turns out it's just the user using an old version and the bug is already fixed since some time. And here again, you want to retrieve, you want to ask for missing information, and if that information is not provided, the one important rule is always close an issue. Always close a ticket. You basically want to do everything to close every ticket as fast as possible. Um, and that you can also perform by labeling. Um, you can use labeling for searching later, for making the information better searchable, but also, for example, the needs info label is very, very good because you can paste, like whenever you're asking someone for information, you set the needs info label. And from time to time, you just go through the needs info issues. And if there's still needs info and there are needs info for a while, you can just close them. Um, you want to ping the person that is knowledgeable with that topic. Um, which is also related to this like similar area thing, similar issues, because that person will know the architecture well. And <laughs> even though that person um, doesn't full-time work or only has the time to do one comment, he might be or she might be uh, able to give some very, very useful advice, even if it's like an internal consultant that is knowledgeable around that area. So. You want to ping relevant developers for a certain issue. Um, and as issues go stale, and especially feature requests um, or bugs that just didn't happen anymore, you'll want to close them. Um, you see this uh, is in, do you, who, who of you knows Sentry? Let's start, start this way. Okay, that's not a lot. Um, so Sentry is an error tracking tool um, that is also originated in the Python community um, and it's pretty popular. So in, tra in Sentry you can pretty t uh, trace runtime errors. And the main point why I'm mentioning is uh, Sentry has an automatic function 
to join errors, but also to delete issues if they don't appear frequently and if they don't appear recently. So if we have an exception that occurs only one time, it's probably just a developer doing something for debugging um, and it doesn't even affect a lot of users. But if an issue affects a lot of users, then it's important. And if not, again, you want to close it. You always want to close issues. Um, and I think the most important part when closing issues is to be polite about it. Just make like one nice template, especially if it's a user filing it or maybe a manager who thought this would be important and then it never took up because it's just not important enough. Um, and allow people and write that down, allow them like, hey, you can reopen this if this is important. But the default should be like, we won't be bothered by this again. Um, so these are actually the seven steps. Um, they are pretty simple. Filter out noise, no questions in this bug tracker. Um, check for duplicates, check for similar issues. We don't want to do duplicate work. We don't want to do work that conflicts. Retrieve missing information. We don't want to work on fuzzy defined issues where we don't even have all the information that we need to reproduce it. Um, label the issues so they are searchable and you can, for example, poll for missing information, close those issues, um, ping the relevant developers and close old issues. So, if you take one thing from this talk, that's it. Close issues whenever you can. I've repeated it enough, I think. Um, but this is just the most important point, I feel, because otherwise the backlog will get fed up. Um, I've also promised to talk a little bit about automation. Um, and I'm, I want to be a bit careful here because this is what we do as a startup. And we have built an open source framework for automating tasks in GitHub and GitLab. Um, and we are currently on the way to integrate Jira for issue tracking. Um, but I only want to talk about the part that is open source because I don't want to do commercial advertisement for any of the paid stuff that we do. Um, so I'll just show you an example of how uh, this could look like. So this was us thinking about like, hey, let's have this fancy new feature. We want to detect missing information automatically with our awesome bot. So we uh, want to maybe identify templates and see if a user doesn't provide a version number. Um, for some reason, this wasn't important, um, but it starts with like, Gitmate is our bot and in the open source version, it has very simple rules. So you can say like difficulty low, maybe I wrote in the description like this is easy or something. And it's a feature which is also usually related to some very few keywords. So part of that labeling and making information searchable can be very easily automate, automated. Um, then we have duplicator related issues and related developers, which are sort of hard um, and actually, this is not part of the open source version, but um, I didn't find a better example. Um, but you can, for example, trigger the mention of a certain developer based on keywords as well. Um, and then we have this situation that this feature wasn't really important. We didn't have any clients asking for it, so we didn't do it. We never assigned someone. Um, and eventually, Gitmate closed this because it's a feature request. And uh, then I reopened it because I thought, oh, it would be nice. And eventually, Gitmate closed it, and we finally realized we're never going to do this. Um, so closing um, issues automatically, is, it sounds sort of scary, but you can still reopen them, and it does work in practice. Um, like, Gitmate closes. I guess five issues every week for us um, because we're pretty small. We don't have like a high throughput, um, but it just keeps our backlog clean. And uh, this is all just based on some simple rules. Um, yes, so this was an example. Um, 
I guess I want to go into like a more interactive mode now. Um, so either if you want, I can show you how we are doing this automation and how you could write your own automation with Gitmate, um, as in the open source framework. Like how could you write an automation that automatically unassigns a person if it hasn't been active for some time, which is a common problem that we had, for example, in the Koala open source community. Um, we could also just answer, or I can also answer any other questions that you have. Um, yeah, it's uh, up to you what we're going to do now. First option. First yes. yes? Cool. <clears throat> so, Gitmate is a Python framework. So, good that we are at a Python conference. Um, and basically, the way it works, it, is re it responds to events. So, um, this is an example for a Gitmate plugin that automatically adds a stale label if an issue is inactive for some time, and it removes the stale label if there's some activity in the issue. So, what we see here is we have this decorator, the responder, and it reacts to any activity on the issue. And it receives an entity, which is either an issue or a merge request or pull request. Um, those are abstracted classes. And the plugin does not need to worry about, is this on GitHub? Is this on GitLab? Is this on a mailing list or whatever? Um, so we've built an abstraction called iGit, the interface for Git hosting platform. Um, also, iGit is the German word for a taste of disgust, so it kind of fits the Git naming scheme. Um, and then you basically have those issue objects, and you just start performing operations on them. And in this case, we have the, um, the unlabeling, no, wait. Well, I'll, I just go, don't explain this condition because I don't understand it right now. Um, but basically, we, did, we just go through, like, if this is a merge request, and if any of the mentioned issues uh, have changed and you update the merge request, then we remove the stale label from all those issues that it relates to because there was activity. And uh, you can just use those objects to manipulate any data. Um, and very, very similarly, you can just have a scheduled responder. And especially if you're working with, like, I want to label issues as they go stale. You need cron jobs that run, like, uh, twice daily, I think, at 0 and 12 uh, a.m. server time. And then you just uh, search for issues in the repository um, that are open and that are not updated for some time. Um, and then you comment with a polite command like, hey, this issue seems stale, I've unassigned you, but please reassign yourself. So do the action, default to unassigning or closing, and allow people to um, be active and actively take and continue working on this task. Was this confusing or not? Helpful a bit. Hmm? Um, you mean for, uh, pull requests related to an issue, right? Um, so in iGit, we have the uh, mentioned issues. Or what do you mean? Oh, okay. Um, you mean the automatic duplication yeah, detection? Exactly. Okay. Um, disclaimer, this is not part of the open source version, version but I can explain. <laughs> um, so we basically take a bunch of machine learning. Um, so machine learning is basically just statistics in my world. And uh, deep learning, which is like more statistics and a neural net on top of it. Um, and we take like lots of different approaches and we mingle them all together with the decision tree. Um, and for that, we basically compare the pairs of 
every possible pair of the new issue compared to the old issue. Um, the problem is if you have a repository with 20,000 issues, you have 20,000 pair comparisons. So if I have an algorithm that can predict if a pair is a duplicate with a 99% accuracy, and I do that comparison 20,000 times, and it gets like one wrong every 100 times, then I still got a huge list of false positives compared to the true positives. Um, and that's basically why we take like many different approaches that are orthogonal to each other, or at least cover different aspects, and uh, try to get the precision really, really up uh, higher and higher. Um, but yes, basically, that's, that's the rough way we're uh, attempting to solve the duplicate problem. It works as a service, yes. I mean, you can uh, use it for free for any open source project anyway. Um, the code is on code.gitmate.io, and the service is on gitmate.io, which is not working because we don't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay. Any further questions? Um, yes. So I told you about this iGit framework before, right? Do you remember? Yeah. Okay, so the iGit framework is the abstraction that has an implementation for GitHub and GitLab right now. And we are currently working on an implementation for JIRA as well. And uh, we could implement it for a bit bucket. And that would mean that all this automation that we have and that you can create with this system works on bit bucket as well. I get, yes. I-G-I-T-T. -T. Um, it's open source on GitLab. Um, 